Today, I'm honored to have Scout Sinclair Brody, a PhD alum of, uh, of our very own Pavel Sudikov, and uh, worked as a product manager at Google for a while, and has been, for almost the last year, leading a startup uh, in open source security. So, Scout! Thank you very much, Professor Smith. Um, <laughs> uh, so, how many of you all are computer science graduate students? So you're the ones I'm going to expect to fall asleep since you're required to be here because it's colloquium, right? <laughs> All right, hopefully I'll keep you awake because I have definitely been in your seat and have a lot of empathy for you. Um, I encourage uh, all you all especially, everyone in general of course, but all you all especially to ask lots of questions during the talk. Feel free to raise your hand and interrupt. I'm happy to go with stuff on the fly as well at the end as at the end um, talking about you know things that uh, might be applicable to you as you look toward your time after Dartmouth. Happy to chat about that as well, although I won't necessarily cover it explicitly in the talk. So um, like I said, I have been in your shoes. Um, my dissertation here at Dartmouth was called Access Control in and for the Real World. Um, I spent some time in a couple of large hospitals uh, that shall remain nameless, as well as a large software company that is not the one I worked for, um, and some large banks uh, on Wall Street studying the way that they actually did access control. Um, and the fun thing for me about my dissertation that it was not just was that it wasn't just sort of looking at this abstract formal system, but it was looking what happened at what happens when the rubber meets the road, when you take these abstract formal systems that have been developed for particular contexts and you try to actually deploy them in the real world. Um, and I found, of course, that access control as it is practiced in the real world is horribly, horribly fundamentally broken. All of the assumptions that were developed in the sort of military intelligence uh, uh, context do not apply wholesale to the medical banking and software development contexts. I took that sort of real world approach and went to Google, where I was a product manager. That is me in front of the building that I actually worked in. Um, on my second year there, I worked on the Android operating system. Um, so my time at Google, I spent one year, I was an associate product manager for two years and a product manager for one. Um, that meant, among other things, that I got to rotate around to different teams and experience different parts of the company. So my first year I was on the security team uh, where I worked on two-step verification. My second year I was on Android where I worked on a whole slew of things, um, including the operating system uh, at both the low level in terms of power and battery management, um, in terms of uh, system UI. I was actually the first product manager for the Android Wear uh, platform, which was really fun. Um, as well as the Google keyboard. And then my final year, I actually moved to New York where I worked on uh, sort of internet freedom technologies, including a project called uProxy and a project called Constitute. Now, the really neat thing for me as someone with an academic background about going to being a product manager is I was in that context where the rubber meets the road. I was not just sort of studying problems for the sake of studying problems. I was studying problems for the sake of 100 million users or a billion users. So one concrete example, when I was working on battery and power management in Android, I was uh, participating in the design of APIs that were developer facing, but designed to improve battery life for end users. And so I was thinking about an ecosystem that consists of the device manufacturers, the carriers, the application developers, and the end users, trying to design a software programming interface in such a way that will incentivize all of these different players to do the right thing and give end users better battery life on their devices. Kind of a hard problem, especially when you realize that, again, a billion users are going to be using your decisions. It's really, really kind of amazing. Um, working at tremendous scale, uh, with tremendous possibility for impact, and really, I'll be honest, doing a lot of it kind of by the seat of your pants, because you don't always know what the right answer is. But you have to make decisions on the fly, unlike, I think, sometimes in academia, where it's possible to sort of hem and haw and be like, oh, but what is the optimal decision? What is the perfect decision? You don't have time for that. You have to actually ship stuff. We'll get to the, some of the differences of these different contexts a bit more later. But the point is, is I spent a lot of time on teams that were distributed around the world, shipping actual software that had lots of impact for lots of users. Um, after that, I became executive director for a nonprofit. 
totally random. That is me actually uh, six months pregnant um, at the, the, right before the launch party for Simply Secure. Um, my husband, who is also a former graduate student here and alum of the PhD program, got a position uh, as a professor at Swarthmore College. And I had been commuting from Philadelphia to New York for a year, three days a week. And when I got pregnant with our first child, decided that I wanted to call that quits, do some consulting, wasn't exactly sure what my plan was. And then a friend uh, who was still at Google approached me about the possibility of working as executive director for Simply Secure, a new nonprofit that she wanted to start. I'll go into more detail about that in a second, but I do want to show you the inevitable launched product of that time period, um, which is my son William, who is wonderful and hanging out over in Sudikoff. Big thank you to my mom who is babysitting while I am giving this talk. Um, so that's sort of some of my history uh, and where I come from and the perspective that I bring in talking about these problems. Okay, so where are we today? We are in a post-Snowden world. Has everyone heard of Edward Snowden? Yes, of course. What does Edward Snowden mean? What do Edward Snowden's revelations mean? The media tells us, oh my gosh, this is awful. This is scary. This is horrible. This is going to change the world. Edward Snowden is revolutionizing people's understanding of privacy as we know it. Everyone cares about security. This is a huge new thing. The security curmudgeons are like, eh, yeah, OK. The government's spying on us. <laughs> We know that. We knew that. We're not that surprised. We're already using Tor. We're already using PGP. We're already using all these tools that exist to keep our data secure and private. What about average users? This is a nice sort of generic group of people. I found nice stock photography. What about average users, people who are not in the media, people who are not security curmudgeons, who, don't, who aren't technologists? Are they actually being impacted by the Edward Snowden revelations? Is their behavior actually changing? We know that they're a little bit more aware of security and privacy issues, but are they actually changing anything about how they live their lives? There's an interesting article in the April um, edition of the Communication of the, the ACM that indicates no, that, that average people probably are not changing their behavior. Now, when I was at Google on my final, um, my final assignment in New York, uh, I was working in the world of uh, sort of internet uh, freedom technology, as I said. And my manager said to me, OK, Scout, we're, we're having this conference. And we're going to have you know, people from Amnesty International. We've got all these activists and all these different people who, who work with users under threat. We should figure out a great new tool that we can build for them to help them. Because they're all hyped up about Edward Snowden. So let's find a way to help them and fix their problems by building a new tool. And I went and I talked to these activists and these people who work at Amnesty and, and around the world with people in Syria and China and, and with users under threat. And they said, please don't build another tool. We have so many tools. And we're trying really hard to train all these users under threat with these tools, these activists and these journalists with these tools, because these tools are so gosh darn hard to use. Can you please just make these tools more usable? You're Google. You've got lots of money. Can you pay these developers to spend more time on usability? Because this is important. Now, the trick is, of course, that the people who build these tools are not average users. Average users have a certain set of needs, a certain understanding of the context in which they work, a certain set of problems that they face. And the people who are building these tools, not, not all of the time, not all of the tools, but most of the people who are building these end-to-end -end encryption tools, they're tool makers. They are the people who, who understand the technology from top to bottom. They understand the threat model, and they build a tool for themselves and people like them. But these tool makers, who, by the way, live in a tool shed, they don't live in the real world that all the rest of us live in. They don't live in Syria. They don't live in China. They don't live in the rural United States, maybe. They live in a very particular context with a certain group of people. These tool makers are not average users. And again, this is sort of supposed to represent a diverse group of people from a variety of contexts. So who is going to really speak for these users? Who is going to make the tools for these users? Who is going to help the tool makers who live in the tool shed develop tools that are effective and usable and useful and applicable to these folks? Well, we've got a couple of options. 
we have academia, we have industry, and we have open source software developers. Now, academia, I'm going to put my cynical hat on for all three of these. Academia has a lot of strengths. You all are at the bleeding edge. But you're also very publication driven. And the side effect of being very publication driven means that a lot of the work you do isn't exactly production quality. Sometimes, maybe not, I mean, maybe you all are shipping like beautiful code that's perfectly documented, well commented, uh, you know, version controlled in, in with nice check-ins, everything is beautiful, right? Like, like that's, that's the code that you are developing, correct? All you systems people. Um, but other academics at other institutions uh, tend to work on more kind of one-off solutions or sort of ephemeral solutions that, oh, I built this you know, system for this paper and I shipped the paper and the paper was the real product, not actually the tool. The trick in the security community, particularly the systems, uh, the, the, folk, the, the academics who research security systems, is that there tends to be an inevitable focus on flaws rather than on solutions. I found a flaw in Android. I found a flaw in uh, you know, Dropbox's you know, client. I found a flaw in this encryption algorithm. How many people are really you know, going to be that successful publishing academic papers where you're saying, I found a solution to Dropbox's problem. Maybe if you're looking at Android with something that large a scale, you can get a couple of papers published. But for the most part, the flaws are the things that really grab attention and get you the publications that you need. So the incentives, when it comes to creating tools for average users, for, for, for users outside of the tool shed, are not exactly right in academia. So what about industry? Now, Google and companies like it are really good at shipping products at scale. They do production work, high quality code, well reviewed, stable, uh, well audited, few vulnerabilities, everything you're looking for in code, but the, pro the, the people that they're targeting their tools at is the masses. They are targeting for scale solutions, something that is going to work for you and you and you and you and you and all of you, regardless of what your threat model is, regardless of where you live. Not exactly regardless of where you live. They mostly target stuff at sort of Western context. They're trying to break into the developing world, but that's a different story. Now, the other problem with indus industrial development and, and sort of the challenge that they face in trying to develop tools for these users that preserve their privacy and offer them greater data security is that they've got a really bad reputation problem. Um, you know, people think, oh, Google, they're evil. You know, if you're, you know, Google, they don't sell Gmail, they don't sell products, these companies don't sell products, they sell users. They sell users' data. And any company that is going to make their money from users' data is fundamentally incapable of developing a privacy-preserving technology that we can trust. So therefore, Google, these big companies, horribly evil, can't trust them. That's the cynical view of industry. What about open source software? Open source software they're really serious about security. They don't have the reputation problem that industry does. And they don't have the problem that academia does of sort of being ephemeral, you know, flitting from here to there, project to project, mostly. Um, but they do have the challenge of not always being well equipped to meet user needs. Because folks in the open source software community are, and I'm, I'm making broad generalizations here that are definitely not always true, but by and large tend to be more technically inclined. They tend to be part of the open source software development community because they are themselves software developers. They're interested in writing code, in building their credentials on GitHub and you know, various open source repositories where they can sort of show their stuff to future employers, or being able to make a difference using their technical capacities. Now, this is problematic because we don't have a lot of people who have design expertise participating in open source software development. We don't have um, a lot of decision-making processes in these projects that allow the incorporation of design thinking like we do in an industrial context where you need, because you know, the trick with design thinking is that you can't always do it by consensus. You know, we've got a green button and we've got a blue button. Which one's better? We could debate this all night long. You need someone on some level to come in and say, 
I have a design voice, I have a design aesthetic, I have a design vision that I'm trying to apply to this interface, and I'm going to say that the green button is better, you know, and have the conclusion sort of, have the conversation come to a bit of a conclusion. It's really hard to do that in the sort of decision making processes that exist in open source software. And finally, even if you can get a designer to come in and be willing to participate in these discussions and be that, you know, put their neck on the line and say, I want the green button and this is the design voice that we're using, there's a bit of a culture challenge. Um, I don't know how many of you have spent time contributing to open source software. Imagine like the techiest, nerdiest conference that you go to and imagine the sort of froofiest art student that, that you know and trying to transport that art student into the tech conference and convince the hackers to trust the art student and give them power over the decision making that they're doing around their software development. It's really hard. There's a big culture clash that exists between designers and software developers. So that is where Simply Secure comes in. Because these three communities, while they all have something to offer to the challenge of creating tools that are useful and usable by average people, tools that pre preserve their privacy and increase the security of their data while it's in transit and at rest, none of them are perfectly equipped to surmount the usability challenges in particular that these tools face today. So simply secure. Whoops, backwards, forwards. There we go. Like I said, started out with just me. Um, I got recruited to uh, found Simply Secure, do sort of the legwork to establish it about a month and a half before its launch party. Um, so that was really tricky because I was six months pregnant. Uh, here I was starting a company, which I've never done before, having a baby, which I've never done before, flying overseas to London to talk to the press about this big thing that Google and Dropbox are funding. Um, and uh, it was really tricky. Um, the nice thing is, is that I was able to hire a couple of really awesome people to work on it with me. Um, Amy Elliott is our design director and Trouble Plunkett is our operations manager. We don't have a good headshot for Trouble, so she uses this really neat graphic we have from our website. Um, but uh, so uh, the, uh, we have these wonderful people working for us. Um, we are currently supported by Google, by Dropbox, and the Open Technology Fund. Um, to do exactly this uh, thing that I've been talking about, which is improving the usability of open source security and privacy tools. Now, you might be asking yourself, remember I said with my cynical hat on, that Google and these industrial players have the reputation of not wanting um, to support uh, you know, user security and privacy because users are the product. Why is a company like Google or a company like Dropbox trying to support Simply Secure? Well, because these companies actually do seem to care a lot about improving end user privacy. Although they cannot necessarily build end to end encryption into their products because they, again, are looking at creating products for the masses, they recognize the value of having those add ons, those platform enhancements, be avail being available to the general pro uh, public. So, our mandate or our um, direction that the initial sponsors set out for us was to not only work on tools that are standalone tools that will help users uh, improve their security and privacy, but also eventually down the road, work on tools that will be able to integrate with the big platforms. And this is important because, once again, end users don't live in the tool shed. They're not using just specialist tools to talk to one another, just to pri people who are interested in privacy and security. They're using the mass market tools to talk to their family members, to talk to their relatives, to talk to their friends from high school who don't know anything about security and privacy and who are very attached to being on the mass media uh, or mass market social media platforms. Okay, so that's about that. Now, our mission, as I've said, um, is a bit, uh, you know, is, is relatively. I think I've explained that relatively well. Um, something I want to note, we are trying to be a nonprofit. We're in the process of applying for nonprofit status from the IRS, which is a whole game unto itself. Um, so our mission is, first and foremost, charitable and educational. Um, within that space, we are trying to improve the usability of open source tools in a way that allows our work to grow beyond just the dir direct collaboration that we do. Um, our activities include direct collaboration with tool makers, uh, providing materials so that folks can do what we do on their own, um, and community building within this space. 
OK, so when we talk about usability, so let me briefly pause. I've just told you a lot about a lot of different things. Any questions at this point? OK, so usability. What do we mean? Uh, what do I mean when I say usability? Do I mean just the interface that you interact with? Do I mean, hey, this has pretty colors and I like it? Uh, what does usability actually mean? What are we trying to impact when we work with these tool developers through our direct collaboration? Um, we are looking at, first of all, usability. Our, our design director, Amy, would chide me for using the tool usability first and foremost. She says, Desi usability is, is a low bar. Usability is the bare minimum that we should be you know, uh, striving for. What you should instead be aiming for is design. High quality design, high quality aesthetics, high quality well thought out, not just interfaces, but entire user experiences. Now, a user experience, I like to say, is every touch point that exists between what the software team does and what the user sees and interacts with. So that includes the interface, certainly. It includes the messaging on the website. It includes the documentation. It includes the help forum that you go to ask questions and give feedback. It includes all of these places that the user touches the work product of the software team. That is the user experience. And so when we work with software teams and help them improve their user experience, we're looking not just at the interfaces, but how well those interfaces and that experience is localized. Do you have interfaces that make sense when they are translated into Chinese, and into Thai, and into Vietnamese, and into maybe Swahili, or all of the other languages that your potential users are? Um, do you have a path that makes sense for users who are maybe interested in using a tool in this space to actually adopt your tool? Do you have messaging that exists that will help users understand what your tool provides and why they should want to use it? That's sort of the adoption pathway. Um, promotional and self-help messaging, similar vein. Um, and finally, a path for user feedback is critically important because if your tool doesn't have a path for user feedback, you're never going to hear back from your users about how to actually improve it in their mind. OK, secure communication. Uh, I talked about, you know, all right, we're trying to make these tools more usable. What tools? The secure communication tools. Well, what do we mean by secure communication? Secure communication uh, is really, um, whoops, there we go. All right, sorry, I forgot I didn't have a slide for that. Um, secure communication is any type of data sharing that exists between two end users. So you and I want to share data either through email or chat or file sharing or any other number of transports. But our focus as an organization is on communication between two end users. So that's what I mean by secure communication. Um, what kinds of collaboration are we going to be doing? Uh, we want to have two basic models to start with for working with software developers who are designing, who are working on these secure communication tools. Um, we want to have deep collaboration, what we call, uh, where we sit down with a tool maker and we work to improve their tool slowly and iteratively over a long period of time. Um, this would involve doing uh, a deep and thorough evaluation, not just of the initial impression of the tool, not just the first use experience, but really all of those aspects of the user experience that I enumerated before. Um, and studying those tools with a variety of methods, not just lab user studies. Uh, by the way, how many of you have ever done a user study? OK, how many of you have ever done a user study that was outside of any kind of user study or user evaluation that was outside of a lab context? OK, all right. So the point is here, there are lots of different methods for getting feedback from users, direct feedback from users, that aren't necessarily just in a lab context. Um, and I can happy to chat about those with folks afterward. Uh, but we want to deploy lots of different methods in this sort of deep collaboration model. Um, and working with the team iteratively over time, once we evaluate the software, to actually improve the interface, uh, to improve the user experience that the tool has um, in the deep and comprehensive sense. Um, we also have another model of collaboration that we're working on, uh, which we're calling office hours. Sounds very academic. 
uh, but the idea here is that a tool maker, maybe they're a secure communication tool, maybe they're not, uh, they're, maybe they're sort of earlier stage, maybe they don't have lots of users, they're interested in improving some particular aspect of their interface or their interaction. Um, and so they might come to us and say, aha, you know, we have a problem with adoption. Like, what, what's up? You know, we're not sure, but we just aren't getting the users that we expect. Can you evaluate our website messaging and help us understand how to improve it? Or when users go to use it the first time, they have all sorts of problems and we're not sure why. Can you do a quick and dirty study and help us figure out how to improve that? Um, that's sort of the office hours collaboration uh, model where we will choose a particular problem and work with a software team over a limited amount of time to evaluate that aspect of the user interface, user interaction, et cetera, and improve it. OK, so open source. So I've talked a lot about Simply Secure's motivation, uh, the type of work that we hope, and to, hope to do. How do we actually make this work open source? You know, it's one thing to say, we're going to help tool developers improve their tools. But how do we, as a usability and design organization, take our work and bring it into the open source world and make it larger than just ourselves? Well, in short, we want to document the crap out of everything we do. <laughs> um, we want to turn all, take all of the materials that we use in designing studies, in performing evaluations, in making recommendations, in iterating on the interface designs, all of these things, um, all of this collateral, and we want to make it public and share it with the world so that they can learn from it. We want to take, for example, um, one of the things I mentioned there is brand development. Uh, our design director has a fair amount of experience and brand development and sort of thinking about what is your brand and why should someone trust your product and how do you communicate about the capabilities of your product? Wouldn't it be awesome if we as an organization could take a brand development, you know, uh, all of that brand development expertise and wrap it into sort of a brand development in a box kit that you as an open source software developer could take and download and spend a weekend adopting into your hackathon model that you already use for developing code and come out with a brand story that makes sense and makes your user experience stronger. Um, and the ultimate goal of this is to make it so the work that we do is applicable not just to the folks that we collaborate directly with one-on-one, -on -one, but also becomes applicable to anyone who goes to our website and wants to download these tools and use them. Okay. All right. And finally, um, we want to work on building community. Uh, as an organization, this is a big part of our goal, um, looking at the different contexts where people are doing work on this space, um, bringing them together, and providing them opportunities to cross-pollinate their ideas and their efforts. Um, our work so far in this space includes, of course, our sort of traditional blog, Twitter stream, newsletter, et cetera, including guest posts, including guest posts about innovative and interesting work in this space. So if you have uh, a paper or something that you are doing that is really cool that you would like to see featured on our blog, please get in touch. Um, we have a Slack channel. I don't know if you all are familiar with Slack. It's sort of the new school IRC uh, world. Um, and we have a couple of channels there that are open to developers, designers, and researchers who are doing work in this space. Um, and we have, oh yes, our Secure Usability Fellowship Program. Um, we will be announcing our first inaugural group of fellows, uh, hopefully this week, um, supported by the Open Technology Fund. They are paired with host organizations and doing work in this space that kind of borders the applied and academic world, um, uh, sort of straddles that line. Okay, any questions about Simply Secure, what we're doing, our model, our vision? Can I take another sip of water? I have a question. Mm. Right now it's the three of you? Right now it's the three of us. Um, with lots of, uh, uh, well not lots of, with plans to hire consultants to help us with a lot of this work. Are you all co-located? We are not all co-located. That is a nice question. Um, I am outside of Philadelphia where my husband uh, has his tenure track position. Our design director, Amy, is in San Francisco. Um, and our operations manager, Trouble, they are in uh, Boston. Um, so we are a totally distributed organization. 
um, which is kind of a funny model. Um, but we, it's actually kind of really nice to be able to have staff meetings uh, on video conference in your pajamas. Um, and it's, it's a really cool sort of group that we have so far. Um, in person, I've actually never met either of them. <laughs> um, I did the entire hiring process. I had, I forget the, the exact numbers. It ended up being like I scheduled for our, I had them interviewing, all of our candidates interviewing with our board of advisors. So I had, I think, 60 interviews across nine time zones in two weeks or something like that for all of the different candidates. Um, and no one met in person. It was all just uh, virtual. Um, and so we are actually planning We'll be at PETS, the Privacy Enhancing uh, Technology Symposium in Philadelphia, which is very convenient for me right now with the baby. I can't travel too much or too far. So they will be coming together for that workshop, and we're going to have our first in-term, in-person in meeting, which we expect to probably do a few times a year. So that way you can confirm they're not bots. <laughs> <laughs> if they are bots, I want to know who built them, because the video uh, fidelity and responsiveness is really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, and we'll get into this in a second, but like the answer is yes for the threat model that we have. Um, so right now, we are, our primary tools are, um, given my sort of uh, professional lineage, not surprisingly, Hangouts and Google Docs um, because of the collaborative nature of a lot of what we're doing and the need to video chat and screen share and things like that. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. Um, we, do, we are, however, constantly on the lookout for open source alternatives and trying to sort of move as those alternatives become more uh, feature rich and capable uh, to do what we need them to do. For example, we recently, we started out on MailChimp, but just recently moved to PHP List, um, which is an open source alternative um, for newsletter list management. Any other questions about Simply Secure and our model? Well, eventually, what is, like, what do you actually do? Well, so, so <laughs> there's the, you know, the, the direct collaboration, working with software tool developers to improve the tools that they make. Do we eventually have any kind of, or was that what you're getting to? Some kind of stories about what that achievement is? Well, we don't have a lot of achievements yet, okay. um, because we're still, uh, the, the ink is still being written on our initial collaboration agreements. Okay, well, in the other direction then, like in three years if this is a success, what would it look like? Well, what would it well, so there are a few things that would constitute success. One is a broader acceptance of s tools that provide end to end encryption. I mean, that at the baseline is, is an important metric of success, that just more people are using end to end encryption. More deeply, digging into that a little bit further, I don't necessarily mean that people, more people are going to be using the tools that we have today that provide end-to-end -end encryption. Because it's not clear that the tools that we have today that provide end-to-end -end encryption are necessarily going to meet the needs and protect against the threat models that average users that we care about really are worried about at the moment. So, you know, I like to talk about this spectrum that exists between everyone who's using sort of general purpose, Gmail, Skype, whatever tools now, where, hey, look, this is free. And yeah, they're probably doing stuff with my data, but I don't really care because, hey, look, it's free and I get cool functionality out of it on one end. And we've got the, I am wearing my tinfoil hat that is so shiny, I, I buff it every day, and I'm using end-to-end -end encryption for everything. Um, and I think that you know Google is evil, and, and all of those tools are, are the devil's spawn on the other end of the spectrum. You know, the, the tools seem to be in these two camps. And what I'd like to see is something more in the middle, an opportunity to create tools that allow people to communicate with their friends who are over here, but also their friends who are over here, that maybe don't offer the all of the rigorous, perfect, sort of idealized security that exists over here, but helps them with the threat models that they actually care about somewhere in the middle. So sort of creating a greater spectrum of tools depending on what your threat model is. If, if the ink is too dry, too wet, mm -hmm. you talk about exactly. collaboration. Can you talk about a hypothetical collaboration agreement so we can get an idea of sort of what kind of things you're going to be doing in the collaborations you're trying to do? Um, sure. I mean, so so when I was talking about direct collaboration, that was uh, an attempt to explain that, but I can go into some more detail. Um, so say that. 
Arati has a, uh, an end-to-end -end encryption tool that she has hacked up. And she's got a few friends of hers that are maintaining it, and it's an open source project. Um, and she comes to us and says, Scout, we really want Simply Secure to help us um, you know, create a, uh, I already used the website example, we want Simply Secure to help us figure out how to explain to users how to manage their keys. And so we might say, great, this is a very well-defined problem. You're sort of a, a new team, and you're, um, you don't have a lot of users yet. So let's slot you into the office hours collaboration model. And we've got a well-defined problem. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go um, to one of our funders and say, hey, funder, this is a really cool project that we're really excited about. We would like you to provide us some funds to help them improve their product in this one specific way. The funder will look at them, look at the, their mission, sort of where they are. Are, look at them as an organization. Are they well equipped to actually do the work that they say they're going to do? Um, we then uh, hire a consultant or decide that we have the bandwidth in-house to do the work ourselves. We would probably, for example, start with an expert evaluation um, where we get myself, we get our design director, Amy, maybe we get a couple friends in academia and a couple friends in industry to look at the wireframes or the interface that they have today, go through it with a fine tooth comb, and just weigh in on it and say, these are the things that I think are really strong about it. These are the things that are, I think are going to be really hard friction points for users. Um, and, let's, uh, and we sort of give that expert review to the software team. Team. And then probably I, with my more product manager hat on, work with them to prioritize the feedback, identify, OK, these are friction points that we just can't solve right now, but this is sort of low-hanging fruit. Let's try and improve our, our interaction patterns to address this low-hanging fruit first. They go through a, a round of changes in the code, come out with a new design, and then we get a group of users. Maybe we have one of our fellows in New York has a party, um, you know, and by party I mean like gets a bunch of pizza and invites a bunch of you know random users together um, and sets them in front of the tool and says, okay, try and use this tool, try and see how it works, and you know maybe has them do a cognitive walkthrough um, or something that's you know again not very deep engagement, not like a, a diary, a journal diary thing that's going to take several weeks or you know and not even necessarily something that involves a lot lots and lots of users, but that we'll put it in front of real users and actually get real users' opinions on it. And then we, again, take that feedback, work with the team to prioritize the feedback there, work with them to ship improvements, and then, of course, the entire time, take all of the things that we have done, all of the, the materials that we've produced and the insights that we've gained, and document the crap out of it so we can put it on our website and other people can replicate the process. Thank you. Are you hoping at some point that um, Either you go to a funder and, and say, hey, this project looks really good. This is the thing that can be rolled out to scale. Or I mean, our funders say, hey, this one looks like something. Is that kind of the, the, the end goal like it, or, or a, a long term goal? Well, so wearing, putting, taking my sort of program hat off and putting my, my operations hat on for, you know, as the executive director of the organization, I would actually much rather have unrestricted funding from funders. I would rather have a funder come along and say, what you're doing is so awesome, Simply Secure, that I'm going to write you a large check and I want you to, to do what you're doing, only more of it. Like, that's what I'm ideally looking for. Um, in reality, I can definitely see you know, different funders being interested in different you know, specific projects that we work on. Um, as I said, I think that Google and Dropbox, their long-term interest in an organization like this is creating tools that exist not just in the tool shed, not just sort of standalone tools that are for tool developers and the people who already care about privacy, but they can actually be layered on top of the existing commercial platforms and used to interact with people who, who are outside of the tool shed. So, so the transfer is actually really their goal, but you, you'd like something, you'd like to be able to do more, you know, without that. That kind of obstacle. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that I think that we need standalone tools, and I think that we need the layered extensions as well. Um, and I think that usability that that we don't know, we as a community don't know yet, exactly what is really going to be most useful to end users. I think that for some users, it's going to be the layered approach, and I think for some users, it's going to be the standalone tool approach. Um, so I'd like to do, invest in both and, and see what's most effective for which users. Traffic. So are you um, only interested in collaborating with people who build the secure communication tools, or are you also 
Well, so since um, since we are striving for nonprofit status, we need to sort of focus ourselves on our sort of charitable mission, um, which is you know around educating users on you know crafting usable um, interfaces and usable interaction patterns for specifically this group of you know not necessarily for the specifically group of users, but for the privacy and security space. Um, so no, the, the short answer is no. If, if some random software uh, development company is like, hey, we've got a really cool new version of Angry Birds, and like, we need you to help us with your sign, we need you to help us with our sign up flow, we're gonna be like, eh, that doesn't really, that's not in our wheelhouse. That is something that the IRS would consider outside of our program area. Um, and you know, we, any money that we bring in to work on that and any effort that we spend to work on that is actually outside of our charitable and educational mission. Um, I, I don't only work with people who are good, but also it's in your plan to support uh, existing uh, the projects. Yes, absolutely. Definitely interested in approaching some of the projects, and we already have approached some of them at this point. Cool. Any other questions about, uh, about the model and Simply Secure itself? If not, I will go into some fun um, lessons. Uh, you know, I like to, when I go to a developer conference, I like to give sort of a, a usability 101. Um, and these are you know, basically assumptions or concepts or, or tidbits of knowledge that a lot of developers might not have really thought about um, or that might not really fit into your worldview that could be useful um, if you are a technical person. For those of you who have already worked with users, who have done user studies, who are, have spent a lot of time thinking from a user perspective, this might not be as useful. But those of you who, um, who consider yourselves uh, dyed-in-the-wool geeks and, and hardcore technologists, this might be a little, a little eye-opening, hopefully. OK, security does not exist in a vacuum. Security, a secure tool is only secure when it is uh, defined in function uh, of a threat model. So this is secure against that threat, I would argue. Um, similarly, something is only usable when defined as a function of a particular user. You cannot just say, aha, this cup is usable for all users. Because I can guarantee that there is a user somewhere who is going to look at that cup and have a hard time with it for some reason. So you have to define your user group before you can even begin to talk about whether or not something is usable. So a number one lesson as a tool developer who is trying to improve the usability of your tool is know your users. Um, and uh, ideally, if you're working in the security uh, and privacy space, expand your definition of users to be beyond just the first world context. So don't if just look at your friends who happen to be graduate students who have, uh, oh, my biggest problem is that my, you know, my parents are listening in on my com communication and therefore I'm going to build a tool to, to protect against my parents. No, 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 no. Think, think bigger. Think outside of your own context. Think outside of the first world. Um, know the threat model that your tool is supposed to address um, and ask yourself, do your users actually care about this? Because you've defined your users and you've got your tool and a surprising number of software developers in this space don't actually ask themselves the question, do these users really actually care about these tools? And that's one of the biggest problems I find in this space is that they don't. You know, these tool developers, again, are in the tool shed over here with their shiny tinfoil hats and they're like, hey, user over there who's a big, avid Gmail user, you should care a lot about privacy and security and come on over because this tool is going to protect you from the NSA. And this user over here is like, eh, I care about my mom listening into my communication. That's my big threat model. So know your users, know your threat model, understand whether users even care about it, um, and look at how you actually communicate it. Do you communicate your threat model in jargon? Do you communicate the threat model that your tool addresses in a way that users uh, uh, find comprehensible and understandable? Um, and a good example that um, Amy, our design director, uses is the notion of vitamins versus pain pills. Um, so if you are in pain, you are in the market for pain pills. And so if you go to a website that says, hey, here are some pain pills. This is going to solve your problem. If you're already in pain, if you're already in the tool shed with your shiny tinfoil hat, you're like, hey, this is a pain pill. I need a pain pill. This is great. But if you're over there, you might not be in pain, or you might not realize you're in pain. But if the website is talking about vitamins, eh, maybe you need some vitamins. So 
Sean looks a little lost. <laughs> OK, so the idea is that the average user is not in pain, so they're not in the market for pain pills. But they might be in the market for vitamins. And so when you're describing your product, if you describe it in a way that is only intelligible to people who are in pain, then only the people who are already in pain and know they're in pain are going to buy your pain pills. Whereas if you describe it, if you cast it more as these are vitamins, these are good for your health, this is useful for everyone, then everyone is going to be more interested and read your copy and, and engage more with your website. OK, um, next really important lesson. Uh, blaming the user for problems with your tool is inherently about blaming the victim. Have you all heard of the phrase blaming the victim? So when you have someone who's mugged and you say to the person who's mugged, oh, you were walking in a, you know, a dark street and, and this was you know, a poor decision on your part, you're blaming the victim. So if you blame the user for problems that they have with your interaction patterns, you're blaming the victim of your poor design. So if something goes wrong for the user, you need to take, you as the tool developer, need to take responsibility for it, full stop. You can't say, but, but the user, they, they just, they should know, or no one educated the user, or, or any of these things. No, 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 you're the tool developer, you're making the tool for this user. If they're using it and they can't figure it out, it means that you haven't done a good job, not to blame you personally, but it means that you haven't done a good job helping them use your tool. It's your responsibility to help the user do the right thing. So how do you help the user do the right thing? Well, you make it really easy to do the right thing, and you make it really hard to do the wrong thing. Um, this means, uh, so good defaults go a long way. You have the tool configured in such a way that it's easy for users to get it right. This again gets back to the notion of knowing your user, knowing what they need, knowing who they are, and creating defaults that will address their needs and sort of meet them where they are. Now, it's worth noting that you're going to get it wrong some of the time. You're not going to be able to meet 100% of your users' needs. There will be cranky users. You can improve this over time by iterating on your design, getting user feedback, doing studies, doing evaluations. Um, but fundamentally, uh, it's important to note that friction is going to be part of the process somewhere. And by friction, I mean a little bit of unusability, a little bit of difficulty. And there are lots of examples of this. How many of you have ever been using the Chrome web browser and encountered a big red screen that uh, says there's a problem with this site certificate? How many of you have immediately known how to get very quickly and easily to that site? None of you. It's really hard. And that's by, that's by design. I actually couldn't find a good example of this um, uh, when I was making this slide, so I can't show you a picture of the interface. But the Chrome web browser intentionally, when it encounters a site that has an, what it perceives to be a problem with its SSL certificate, makes it really hard for you to do the wrong thing. It creates friction. It doesn't make it impossible for you to do it. If you click around enough, you can eventually get to the site that you were trying to go to. But it makes it really easy for you to do the right thing, which is go away and go somewhere else, and makes it hard for you to do the wrong thing, which is go to this potentially damaging and, uh, and dangerous site. OK. Um, not blaming the user extends to your interface text. This is a, a lesson that I learned from folks, um, from designers on the Android team. It's really annoying and really dispiriting if you are struggling to use a piece of software and you get an error message that says, you made an error with your input, or you, their user, user problem, or you know, your text is wrong, or your password is too short, or you, 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 blaming the user. Once again, don't blame the user. Take responsibility for it. Say, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I'm sorry, be, have an apologetic or you know, humorous to some degree, where appropriate, interface that takes responsibility for the problems that happen and offers the user information in a way that they can hopefully do something about it. Don't just blame the user. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about, in this space, you hear people describing themselves as unicorns. Um, and the idea of a unicorn in software development is someone who understands both coding and visual design. Um, and we don't necessarily need unicorns. We don't necessarily need people who understand visual design in, able, in order to make more usable software, because things like the interface text can actually go a long way toward making the software more usable and more friendly. OK, 
Um, remember that you are a tool maker if you are building a software tool and you live in a particular context. You live in the tool shed. Um, and you need to listen to the users where they live. And it's really important to remember that you can't just go to your, uh, you know, again, to your grad student friends who live down the hall from you in grad student housing and be like, hey, try this tool that I made and tell me what you think of it. You've got to get out into the community. You've got to get down to Newport, New Hampshire, where my mom is a school teacher and people who, you know, are just buying computers for the first time and they're new computer users and, and actually ask them what they think or whatever set of users is appropriate. Um, and remember, uh, when you are listening to, and this happens time and again, every time I've ever seen a tool maker try to interact with an end user, uh, you can't listen and explain at the same time. So if you find yourself trying to ask for feedback from a user about your tool, and you find yourself saying, oh, no, 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 you just have to do this, and you take the mouse and you, you, you find yourself driving the car for them, you need to step back and say, oh, tell me more, or oh, uh, can you can you give me more insight into that? You need to really actively listen and not just uh, tool maker spleen. Um, uh, one caveat that I think is interesting for the academic crowd in particular, when you're listening to users, when you're doing some sort of evaluation or some sort of user study, you don't necessarily need a statistically significant sample. This is really important in academic in the academic world because hey, you're not going to be able to get published unless you have you know results that meet this certain you know probability of do 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 do. But in the real world. You get five users, and I'm serious, like in an industrial context, the user studies that I performed when I was working as a product manager or that I participated in didn't have 35 users with at least half of them you know, performing X, you know, X, Y, or Z in the experimental task. Um, you had 10 users. And they were, you know, some of them were doing well, some of them were doing poorly, but you were looking for more qualitative results than necessarily some sort of quantitative result. And that's very important. Um, and this sort of belief exists and is very common among user experience researchers in industry that, uh, you know, even five users will uncover 95% of the immediate pain points that exist with a particular interface. Okay, um, the purple pony problem. This is something that's really fun. Uh, when I was actually talking to a couple of developers from Tor, uh, I described the purple pony problem, which is you get a bunch of users all the time on your user feedback forum saying, oh, your tool is great, except on page three of the introduction, you know it would be so much better? would be if you had a purple pony that was really sparkly. Because I love purple ponies, and all your users probably love purple ponies, so how about you put a purple pony on page three? And so as a tool developer, it's really tricky to know, OK, this user is asking for a purple pony, and that user is asking for an orange octopus, and this other user is asking for a green seahorse. Like, which, what, what, what is real? Like, what, in, what feedback can I actually trust from users? The ironic part is, is I was talking to a Tor developer who was working basically solo on trying to improve a particular part of the Tor ecosystem's uh, interface. And she said, oh, I actually really like purple ponies. And I, I put them all in my interface. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> um, so the, the bit here is that it's hard for you as a tool developer to distinguish you know, actual meaningful feedback from users you know, versus the opinions that they might have. And this is something that if you've done user studies, it's really important to recognize that self-reported feedback or opinions are nowhere near as valuable as obs observable behavior or observable difficulty. So it's much more valuable to have someone sit down with the interface and tell you what they're thinking and what they're seeing as they're actually seeing it than to ask them to go perform a task and come back and tell you what they think about it. Because human beings are fundamentally unreliable reporters and will give you, they will filter their experience through their opinions and through their perceptions of either what you want to hear or what they think will be ideal for their perceived vision of who the users of the particular tool are. Does that make sense? Cool. OK. Finally. How to help. So if you are a graduate student in particular uh, who is working in systems, please do applied research. Like, so when I went to a conference when I was a grad student, um, it was very dispiriting. I was talking to someone who works in the government. I was describing my research. And they said, oh, what you're doing 
is applied research. And I was like, but uh, yeah, it's interesting. If by applied you mean interesting, then yes. Um, so, but applied research is really valuable. Don't, I mean, science is important. Publications, for you all especially, those of you trying to graduate, publications are very, very important. Get lots of them. But try to think about it not just in terms of the science with a capital S, but in terms of how it's actually going to be applied in the real world. Um, validate your assumptions with applicable practitioners. So I know uh, from talking to some of the folks in, uh, in uh, Dave Coates' lab, you know, don't just go off and, and do this beautiful system. It, the, for, for M Health, you know, go talk to the medical practitioners and actually ask them what things they need and actually understand what, what problems they're really having. Um, also ask yourself, you know, to prevent your tool from being a one-off or ephemeral uh, thing, ask yourself what would prevent this from being useful in the real world? And that's a hard question. But it's something that if you go and work in a production software, the production software development environment like I did, it's something that you constantly have to ask yourself. Because you can have a million and one great ideas for a startup. You can have a million and one great ideas for a new product. But if you can't actually see the barriers to adoption or the barriers of the problems that will prevent that thing from being useful in the real world, well, you're just going to sort of be forever working on one-off little side projects. Um, if you are a systems person, once again, please put your stuff on GitHub. It will uh, hold you to some degree, or GitHub or some sort of public repository where other people can see it. It will be more work, but it will force you on some level to do at least a little bit of documentation um, and get your code at least in some vague uh, world of space of, of being readable by other people. Um, if you are doing a, a user experience research, Try to develop instruments or use instruments that other people have developed that will help you do cross comparison with other people's research. Please don't just say, OK, I'm going to create this brand new scale. I mean, if, there, if, if, you, if a scale exists to compare, um, to evaluate how people respond to a particular type of problem, use the pre existing scale. Don't try to invent your own if you can apply one that already exists. I have some folks to talk to if you're interested in this space and learning about it, particularly within the usable security context. Um, try to find participants that are not just undergraduates. Um, consider methods other than lab studies. Again, happy to talk to you about what those might look like. Um, and share when you share your research, uh, don't just share your design and your results. Also take your actual materials that you use in performing your study and share them so other people can look at them in detail, replicate them, reuse them, et cetera. Um, in terms of collaborating with Simply Secure specifically, you can follow us. Um, you can talk to us and talk with us on Slack. Uh, you can, if you're not really interested in the usability portion, there's a lot of really good projects that need even just code developers. Those are some good resources. Happy to point you to some specific projects if you're really interested in knowing more details. Um, and finally, recommend your favorite open source secure communication tools to me and to us for us to collaborate with them. There we go. All right, what questions do you have now? Or comments telling me I'm full of crap. <laughs> well, you succeed. Yeah. Is an exciting idea? Let's say Jason had a great new tool for configuring systems to be secure against certain types of tamper or something. How would you tell me take that out of the lab for testing? Well, do you mean mechanics of her? Do you mean? So, I mean, don't, so uh, who are the users of it? Well, probably say grid operators, control, control center. Group. Okay. Um, so what I would say is take maybe not necessarily the whole interface, like maybe not a live version of it, but take um, some paper prototypes. You know, so you could do this even before the system is built. Take some paper prototypes and go on a field trip and go and talk to the grid operators in their context where they work and set it in front of them, you know, maybe in the cafeteria, maybe ideally at their desk, and say, tell me what you think of this. 
tell me what do you how do you right now this is the functionality that this is trying to achieve or tell me first of all tell me what you think this is trying to achieve um, if this uh, will not help you tell me how you get this task done right now tell me how you achieve these things that this is trying to achieve you know at the moment would this be better or worse what are the problems with it um, a lot of these conversations can end up sort of crafting themselves because people are very happy to give you their thoughts and ideas. Um, again, there's the challenge in this kind of study of doing it, the self-reporting problem, where people will not necessarily be able to perceive ahead of time what, how they will react to things in practice, but by taking it and bringing it to the people who are actually going to be using the tool in the context in which they work, where they can then point to the problems or the things that they you know, encounter in their current uh, iter version of it, will give you a level of insight that is so much deeper and so much more profound than if you're using undergraduates in a lab or even these particular users in a sort of sterile lab environment where you've got these well-defined prompts that they have to work through in a sort of A to B to C. Yes? So in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that people don't want more tools. But uh, you guys are going to be working with people who are developing new tools. So how, how do you, how are you guys going to work on the overall goal of making the number of tools fewer but more? Well, I don't necessarily think that we need to make the number of tools fewer. Um, my point was that the ecosystem as it exists right now, its greatest need is not new tools. Its greatest need is more usable tools. <coughs> And so certainly, I think there are you know, use cases and problems that exist for which there are not good tools, that you do need to craft new tools. Um, I mean, I talked a fair amount about how uh, Google, Dropbox, you know, big companies are interested in seeing layers of security you know, built on top of you know, like extensions, uh, browser extensions, things like that, that can work on top of their existing platforms. Those would certainly be new tools in many cases. Um, but the trick is that you know, a lot of, there's this great tendency when you're a technologist to try and solve all the problems by building technology. And the trick is here that a lot of people have already spent a lot of time and a lot of person hours building really interesting technology that in a technical sense works very well. The crypto is there, the code is there, the, the, the you know, docu basic documentation is there, the project is successful, except for many of the interaction patterns and issues there. So will simply secure approach existing developers? And this. That's the goal. That's the goal is to initially work with high impact existing tool, secure communication tools. So you know, the ideal collaborator for us to begin with would be you know, one of the secure communication tools that has a bunch of users already, has been established for a while, has a, a development team that's ticking along with regular updates, um, et cetera. You also plan to make users aware. You mentioned that someone doesn't want to pay until they may be market for vitamin mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, And what if they're not? What if they're not? Yeah, I mean, you know that um, you can use end to end encryption, but then some users just don't care about privacy or security. Yeah, well, and I think that that's something that's very important is I don't, you know, I don't expect that every user is going to. I expect that there is going to be a, po you know, a certain critical population and maybe even a majority of the population in the foreseeable future that isn't going to care. And there's nothing that I'm going to be able to say, do, or create that is going to convince them to abandon their current workflows and adopt a new workflow that offers them greater privacy and security with you know, some additional friction. Um, like there's a, a group of users that it's true, there's absolutely nothing that I can do. What I want to do though is take the group of users who are interested in, in privacy and security, make their lives easier, and slowly over time grow that base of users so that it's larger. By growing and spread, uh, spread awareness so that the people who are in the grade who are not aware of these. Yes, risks. but who might be open to it or, you know, people who, uh, you know, and, and again, maybe it's that we're bringing people who would be open to it to existing tools. Maybe it's working with the developers to find new tools that have a little bit less friction, um, maybe offer fewer guarantees in terms of the threat models they protect against, but are more useful to a larger segment of the population. That's a possibility. Yes. <clears throat> so the reason I asked earlier about the video game was, um, so there are lots of um, studies that show that developers 
care about security, but they don't know how to approach the problem. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, maybe they don't have enough time to do mm -hmm. that part. They were like, so since you're just focusing on the secure communication tools, are you missing out on a large amount of developers who want to build that into their tools? But so are you going to, how would you reach out to them? And well, and that's that's something that I hope you know. We talked. To, I talked about the direct collaboration, and I talked about sort of providing community resources as well. Um, the goal would be that if you are a developer and you're like, you know, I really want to make like the security, the secure parts of my interface, or like the security configuration, secure feature uh, configuration parts of my interface more usable. How am I going to go do that? Maybe you could go to the resources section of our website, which doesn't exist yet, but we're in the process of building. Um, maybe you could go to that section of our website, and you could get sort of you know secure security configuration interface 101 where you get you know some guidelines and a basic study that you gather a group of users yourself you sort of plug in your interface and go and get a bunch of insights on it and then can iterate from there. yeah so we might not collaborate directly with those folks but the resources that we create will hopefully still be useful to them <laughs>